Hello, and thank you for joining me for this lecture on bleeding. As an EMT, it's important to be able to recognize bleeding, what kind of bleeding it is, and understand how it affects the body. Keep in mind, bleeding can be external, as we see in lacerations, abrasions, or it can be internal, such as contusions, or bleeding inside the body. Bleeding can cause weakness, shock, and in some cases, eventually death. As we've discussed in the past, it's important to understand the cardiovascular system as an EMT. In fact, the cardiorespiratory systems are the ones that the EMT should be especially knowledgeable of in order to get their job done. Now, in the cardiovascular system, as it relates to bleeding, it's important to know that the cardiovascular system circulates blood to the cells and tissues. It delivers oxygen and nutrients, and it takes away metabolic waste. Now, this is really important when we're talking about bleeding. We need to, of course, get nutrients and oxygen to the uh, tissues, but don't forget about the waste products being taken away. This is why it's particularly important that we have blood flow to the kidneys and liver. We'll talk about that more later. So let's take a look at the parts of the cardiovascular system. We of course have the three parts. We have the pump, which consists of the heart, the container, the blood vessels, and the fluid itself, the blood and other body fluids, plasma, lymph. Now, remember that if we have a failure of any one of these due to bleeding, and keep in mind, we have to remember that bleeding isn't always just related to trauma. There's medical reasons people bleed also, but any disruption in the cardiovascular system to any of these three areas can be especially dangerous to the patient and cause morbidity or mortality. Now, as you remember, the heart needs a well-distributed, rich blood supply, and it consists of two pumps, the upper chamber or the atria, and the lower chambers or the ventricles. So, as you remember, blood comes in to the heart through the superior and inferior vena cava. It passes from the right atrium, right atrium there, into the right ventricle. And then from there it is expelled into the lungs through the, what? The pulmonary artery. Remember, arteries take blood away to where veins bring it back to the heart. So when we come back, the blood then goes through the pulmonary veins back into the left atria to the left ventricle, then out through the aorta. And from the aorta, it goes into the different parts of the body. There we go. Now we have different types of blood vessels. We have arteries, which again, carries blood away from the heart. Arterioles connect the arteries to the capillaries. So we go from arteries to arterioles to capillaries. Capillaries link the arterial system and the venous system, the arterioles and the venules, and then the venules empty into the veins and the veins carry the blood back to the heart. Now, as blood, especially the individual blood cells, pass through the capillaries, nutrients and oxygen are put off into the cells, 
and waste products are then taken on. We've discussed this in the past. We're not going to bemoan this too much. We do need to remember that, again, we need blood pressure to push these along. And with bleeding, we have a decrease in blood pressure and this can be disrupted and be injurious to the patient. Blood contains different types of cells. Red blood cells are known for their bright red color. Red cells are the most abundant cell in the blood, accounting for 45 to 40 to 45% of its volume. The shape of a blood cell is uh, what we call biconcave disc with a flattened center. In other words, both faces uh, of the disc have shallow bowl-like indentations. What they primarily do, again, is they move the oxygen, nutrients, and they pick up the, uh, the waste product. White blood cells, also referred to as leukocytes, um, they protect the body from infection. They're much fewer than the red blood cells, accounting for about 1% of the blood. When we talk about platelets, unlike red and white cells, platelets are actually cell, are not actually cells, but they're rather fragments of cells. Platelets help the blood clotting process or coagulation by gathering at the site of an injury, sticking to the lining of the injured blood vessel and forming a platform on which blood coagulation can occur. Plasma is the liquid component, basically the roadway in which everything moves. It's a liquid component of the blood. Um, it's a mixture of water, sugar, fat, protein, and salts. The main job of the plasma is to transport blood cells throughout your body, along with nutrients, waste products, antibodies, clotting proteins, a bunch of other stuff. Now platelets, platelets are the tiny blood cells that help your body form clots to stop bleeding. So if one of your blood vessels get damaged, it sends out signals to the platelets, the platelets then rush to the site of the damage, forming a clot and start to fix the damage. The autonomic nervous system, the fight or flight system, monitors the body's need for blood and where the blood needs to go. It adjusts the blood flow normally by either adjusting the pump, the heart, having it beat harder or faster, or it can direct or redirect blood using the vessels, either the vessels constrict or dilate, moving blood to where it's needed. Say in an emergency, it needs it to the heart, lungs, kidney, and brain. But it redirects it by constricting the blood vessels, perhaps in the skin. That's why we get that pale skin when the patient goes into shock. The whole goal is to maintain homeostasis, the balance inside the body, and perfusion. Now, perfusion is the circulation of the blood within organ or tissue to meet the cell's needs for oxygen, nutrients, and waste removal. This, again, we've talked in the past that the two basic tenets of critical care or emergency care is air goes in and out, blood goes round and round. And this is why we need this. And again, keep in mind, that's just not about getting oxygen and nutrients to the cells. But it's also about getting the waste away from the cells. Remember, if we have a buildup in waste inside the cells, this causes, again, a imbalance of the body's homeostasis and can cause acidosis, other issues that aren't favorable to. Some tissues need a constant supply of blood, while others can survive with very little. Keep in mind, tissues like brain tissue, heart tissue, or heart muscle need a constant supply of blood to su survive. The skin, however, can supply on very little. And remember, skin is the largest organ in the body, and all organs depend on adequate perfusion. Again, perfusion is just not getting oxygen nutrients too, but waste away. And without proper perfusion or adequate perfusion, the organ can die fairly quickly. Now, the significance 
of external bleeding. Hemorrhage means bleeding, they're synonymous, but with serious external bleeding, it may be difficult to estimate the amount of blood. In fact, sometimes it's really difficult. You look, you get somewhere, you see a whole lot of blood. By volume, sometimes it's not as much, but it's important to be able to kind of estimate the amount of blood. And I don't have any clear idea or advice on how to do that. But if they look like they're bleeding a lot, they're bleeding a lot. The body will tolerate a loss, will not tolerate a loss of greater uh, of 20%. Now, when you think about that, what is the average blood supply? In an adult, it's normally between five and six liters. So think of three two liter bottles of, of soda. That's how much. Now, changes in vital signs may occur with significant blood loss. In particular, that increase of heart rate, increase the respiratory rate, and decrease in blood pressure. But please know that a decrease in blood pressure is a late sign of shock, a late sign of hyperperfusion, or excuse me, hypoperfusion, hypotension. So, how well people compensate for blood loss is related to how rapidly they bleed. An adult can comfortably donate 500 cc's of blood, and that's one unit, uh, over 15 to 20 minutes. And that's normally when you go in for a blood donation, that's what they take, about 500 cc's, and they bleed you slowly. Now, if a similar blood loss occurs in a much shorter time, a person can then be tripped into hypovolemic shock. Again, the fight or flight system gets a signal that we're losing blood rapidly and it'll start the shock procedure, the shock process, clamping down the blood vessels, moving blood from the not so necessary tissues to the necessary tissues. So from the skin to the heart, the brains, the lungs, uh, the kidneys. Now, we also have to consider age and pre-existing health when we talk about external bleeding. Keep in mind, children are a smaller package. They can't tolerate as much blood loss. Normally about one or two soda cans um, worth of blood and before they go into shock. But also keep in mind the elderly or people with pre-existing or comorbid factors where their heart or their vessels aren't working as well. And keep in mind, there's some elderly people who are on medications that blunt the vessels from constricting or dilating, depending on their disease processes. These can significantly alter how they're bleeding or control of bleeding naturally occurs. Let's consider the characteristics of external bleeding. Arterial bleeding, again, these are normally large vessels under pressure, causes spurts, the blood tends to be brighter, and sometimes we have the impression that this is a little harder to control. Really, it's not. Venous blood or venous bleeding is dark red. It tends to flow as opposed to spurting. And capillary bleeding is normally a kind of an oozing blood. That's what you would see in abrasion or maybe a surface cut, uh, you nick yourself shaving. So um, not to be considered with a, ho you know, a hockey stick blow which, by the way, can cause capillary bleeding, bleeding in the head. Bleeding tends to stop rather quickly, normally within about 10 minutes. When the skin is broken, the blood flows rapidly or any vessel. So the end of the vessels begin to narrow. They actually constrict to reduce the amount of bleeding. Actually, if we look at the vessels, whether it be an artery, a vein, or a capillary, when these vessels constrict, at a point of, of bleeding, they'll actually spasm 
and that'll help spot, stop the bleeding too. Platelets go to that area, help form a clot, and the bleeding will not stop if a clot doesn't form. Now this is important to think about, especially when we think about people who are on uh, blood thinners, people who have had recent heart surgeries or uh, have a atrial fibrillation, people who are, have atrial fibrillation are normally on blood thinners, or people who are just encouraged for whatever reason to take an aspirin a day, normally have high cholesterols. These all can affect the clotting factors and the ability for the patient to control their own bleeding through cl clotting. Patients with hemophilia, hemophiliacs, lack blood clotting factors. This is a hereditary condition. It's rare, only about 200,000 cases in the United States. Bleeding may occur spontaneously in these patients. All injuries, no matter how trivial, are potentially serious. And these are patients, even with mild bleeding, need to be transported immediately. There are medications that, and factors that they can give the patient at the hospital to help them stop this bleeding. When we talk about internal bleeding, we're talking about bleeding in a cavity or space inside the body. Keep in mind that a hematoma or a contusion are among the internal bleeding issues. Now, it can be serious because it's not easy to detect, especially when we talk about the areas in the body where people bleed out and die. And these are in the head, the chest, and the abdomen. We can also have serious uh, internal bleeding in the legs too. But injury or damage to internal organs commonly result in extensive internal bleeding and can cause hypovolemic shock fairly early and easily. Now there are some medical conditions uh, along with trauma that uh, can cause the internal bleeding. Patients with stomach ulcers, lacerated livers, and trauma, ruptured spleen, broken bones, especially the ribs or the femurs. Keep in mind, ribs, they have uh, arteries, thoracic arteries on the lower part of the ribs. And so when those are broken, they can cut into those arteries and vessels and veins. In the femurs, keep in mind, what big vessel goes along the femur? The femoral artery. Those can tear. In fact, we can lose 1,500 cc's of blood in each femur. Pelvic fractures are especially dangerous when it comes to blood loss. The pelvis is rich in blood vessels. In fact, when we do a blood marrow retrieval from children in particular, we take it from the pelvis, from the arch of the pelvis. When we talk about mechanism of injury for internal bleeding, let's look at some of the high energy mechanisms. Now these should increase your index of suspicion for serious unseen injuries. Now these are falls uh, with, for adults greater than 20 feet, uh, children greater than 10 feet or two to three times the uh, patient's height, the child's height, high speed auto crashes, any deep intrusion inside a car during a, a crash, any auto pedestrians, especially over 20 miles an hour. Same with motorcycle crashes. These are all things that we, or some of the things we would consider as high energy mechanisms. So internal bleeding is possible whenever the mechanism of injury suggests that severe forces have affected the body. Use your DCAP BTLS for look for any other sign of injury. Now, when we talk about nature of illness, people who have internal bleeding from different illnesses, if you will, are non-traumatic. And these may be bleeding ulcers, uh, bleeding from the colon, ruptured ectopic pregnancies. We talked about that, and we also talked about aneurysms. These are the things that would cause internal bleeding, and again, these could be made worse if the patient is on blood thinners.
So let's look for signs and symptoms of internal bleeding. Of course, the most common is pain. Swelling in the area of bleeding, distension, especially in the abdomen, or uh, any tightening around, say, the femurs. Dyspnea, tachycardia, hypotension, any hematoma that develops. Now keep in mind, we're just not talking about hematomas, you know, in the periphery, but hematomas that develop on the body centrally, in particular the abdomen. Bruising, of course, any bleeding from any body opening, meaning the rectum, uh, the urethral meatus, uh, where your urine flows out of, um, ears, nose, mouth. We want to look for uh, hematemesis, which is uh, vomiting of blood. Melano, which is a passing of blood, either as a dark stool or uh, gross red blood. Watch for pain, tenderness, bruising, or guarding in any area of the body. And think about also the rebound tenderness, where we, in the abdomen, where we push down and release, and release, there is an increase of pain. Broken ribs, bruises over the lower part of the chest, or a rigid, distended abdomen are all signs of possible internal bleeding. And remember, hypoperfusion can be seen in pale skin, clammy skin. Hypoperfusion can also be detected with an anxiousness in the patient's demeanor. A decreased level of consciousness because perfusion isn't making it to the brain. And one of the not too often talked about signs of hypoperfusion is the patient complaining of thirst. And this is out of my personal experiences. I've had more than a handful of patients who were seriously bleeding internally that have looked at me and said, I am really thirsty. So that's a pro tip right there. So as we get into assessment and treatment, we always start as usual with a good scene size up. Be alert for potential hazards, and of course, follow your standard precautions. You have to open your eyes and determine the mechanism of injury or the nature of illness. Look around, see what possibly hurt the patient, and also be aware that what hurt the patient may also hurt you, whether it be a unstable motor vehicle, one that's on its side in a ditch, or somebody running around uh, with a gun or a knife. Also consider the nature of illness, and that takes a little more finesse. You have to listen to the patient, get a good patient history, and look for these little occult signs and symptoms, especially stuff like aneurysm. And we'll bring up a case on that. Consider the need for spinal mobilization or additional resources. And additional resources, including ALS, Make sure you call for them early. In your primary assessment, don't be distracted from identifying life threats. Some of these injuries can look bad and not be bad, but they can mask or distract you away from something that is very serious. Form your general impression, perform your rapid exam like you would any other time. Address those life-threatening bleeding, again, uh, direct pressure or tourniquet, assess the skin color, pay special attention to that, determine level of consciousness, and we can start simple with the APPU scale. Are they alert? Do they respond to verbal stimuli, painful stimuli? Again, that can be as simple as just shake and shout, or are they responsive, unresponsive? We want to look at the airway and breathing. Ensure that the patient has a patent airway. Apply suction if you have to. And if they're having copious amounts of bleeding, especially from the mouth, we want to get them on their side. Keep in mind, we want to make sure that we maintain cervical stabilization if necessary, provide high flow oxygen or assist ventilations as necessary, and insert an airway adjunct 
if the patient is unconscious. Again, if they're bleeding orally, probably your best airway adjunct would be a nasopharyngeal airway, unless you suspect a severe head injury. You want to assess the pulse rate and quality. Is it weak? Can we barely feel it? Is it rapid? Those are signs of shock. Again, skin color and condition. Is it skin pale? That's from the body shunting blood from the less necessary skin to the more necessary organs of the heart, the brain, the kidneys. Color and temperature. Are they pale? Are they showing cyanosis around the lips, the ears, and skin temperature? Are they hot? Are they cold? And control any external bleeding and treat for shock. Remember, treating for shock is fairly simple. We maintain the airway. We apply oxygen. We support ventilation as necessary. Keep the patient warm. And by the way, in trauma, it's incredibly important to keep the patient warm. In fact, the lower the body temperature in uh, hemorrhagic shock or in trauma, the higher the morbidity and mortality. So it's really important to keep the patient warm. Now, you want to determine your transport priority. So. Signs implied rapid transport, of course, is that tachycardia, that rapid heart rate, and rapid breathing. A low blood pressure, keep in mind that that's a late sign of shock. So you're behind the eight ball already. Clammy skin and a weak pulse are also important to determine how quickly you need to transport. So it comes down to the adage of either load and go, meaning don't monkey around on scene, or stay in play, meaning that you have time to examine, stabilize before you transport. History and taking is very important. You want to in investigate this chief complaint. Now, if the patient has an altered mental status or is unconscious, you may have to depend on bystanders or family. Ask the patient about any blood thinning medications. And this is especially important in the elderly patients who fall. We want to know if they're on blood thinners. You can ask anybody on blood thinners, but especially the elderly, especially if they've hit their head. If the patient is unresponsive, again, look for medical alert tags and why dear the bystanders. Record your vital signs. A systolic blood pressure of less than 100 with a weak rapid pulse suggests the presence of hypoperfusion. They need to get going to the hospital fairly quickly. With a critically injured patient or a short transport time, there may not be enough time to do a secondary assessment. These are normally done on the way to the hospital if you have time, if you're not busy doing other things. Look for all areas of DCAP BTLS. Look for uncontrolled bleeding from large scalp lacerations. Keep in mind that the head is very vascular and those wounds bleed copiously. Feel all four quadrants of the abdomen for tenderness and rigidity. Again, take your time, do this right, but do it quickly. Record pulse, motor and sensory function, all four extremities, and look for signs of eternal, internal bleeding. Again, that is any swelling, bruising, rigidity. And in our reassessment, reassess the patient, especially in the areas that show abnormal findings. Again, unstable patients every five minutes, unstable patients every 15. Again, we want to make sure that we constantly are looking at the patient, getting vital signs, checking those areas of concern. Try not to miss anything. In your documentation and when you communicate to the hospital, either by phone, radio, or when you get bedside at the hospital. Recognize, estimate, and report the amount of blood loss and how rapidly or over what period of time it 
it occurred. Again, this normally takes a little bit of time for history taking. Communicate all relative inform relevant information to the staff at the receiving hospital and carefully document all injuries, the care provided, and the patient's response. Again, be careful about being distracted by big injuries and not getting uh, the and looking at the little injuries. In our emergency medical care, make sure we follow stand precautions, uh, wear gloves, eye protection, and if there's a lot of bleeding, a mask and gown. Make sure the patient has an open airway and is breathing adequately. We talked about this already. Provide high flow oxygen. Control obvious life threatening bleeding as quickly as possible. Now, several methods are available to control external bleeding. Direct pressure, and that's even pressure at the site and elevation. Pressure dressings and or splints. And tourniquet. So let's talk about these. Direct pressure is the most effective way to control external bleeding. In fact, I have found that this is probably 99.9% .9 of the way you're going to control bleeding. Now keep in mind, with most people, with especially external bleeding, the body is going to start taking care of itself. Those vessels are going to constrict, they're going to spasm, their clotting, their natural clotting is going to go ahead and start. So. Pressure stops the flow of the blood and permits normal coagulation. So we're kind of augmenting the body's natural clotting and, and bleeding control factors. Apply pressure with your glove fingertip or hand over the uh, top of a sterile dressing and hold uninterrupted pressure for at least 10 minutes. Remember, it takes about 10 minutes for blotting to effectively occur. With your pressure dressing, we firmly wrap a sterile, self-adhering roller bandage around the entire wound. Stretch the bandage tightly enough to control the bleeding, but you should be able to still palpate a distal pulse or have good capillary refill. We don't want to wrap it so tight that it becomes a venous tourniquet, which then uh, in turn increases bleeding, not decreases bleeding. We always say don't remove a dressing until a physician has evaluated the patient. Sometimes nurses will want you to take off the, the dressing once you get in, and that's okay. Be ready to control bleeding again, but apply additional pressure through the dressing and add more dressing over the first. Keep in mind too, when we're dealing with dressings, less is more a lot of the time. You can get more pressure on a little amount of dressing as opposed to a large amount of dressing. Now we do have hemostatic agents. Now these are chemical compounds that slow or stop bleeding by assisting in a clot formation. And these can be used with direct pressure when direct pressure alone is ineffective. Now these are in our protocols for you to use and a lot of departments stock them. It's an optional item in the pharmacopoeia. If you want to use them, feel free, but don't stuff wounds with these clotting agents. Tourniquets have made a big comeback. In fact, easily 10 years ago, we were really anti-tourniquet. You know, you only used a tourniquet in the matter of life or limb. Well, we've learned through our experiences in a wartime theater that tourniquets are actually fairly effective and they've seemed to you know become much safer so this is useful from patients that have extremity injuries there's several types of commercial tourniquets uh, when we get into practical sessions we'll work with tourniquets but if a commercial tourniquet's not available you can use a triangular bandage uh, with a stick or a rod and um, in fact you can even use a, a pair of trauma shears to make a tourniquet. There are some basic precautions that we have to observe when we use tourniquets so. Don't apply a tourniquet directly over a joint. 
It's just not going to work. It's kind of, common, kind of common sense. Make sure the tourniquet is tightened securely. Again, don't use wire, rope, a belt, or any other narrow material. It'll cut into the skin. It'll actually damage the skin. Place padding under the tourniquet. Never cover a tourniquet with a bandage. The reason being is we want to see the tourniquet. We want to know that the tourniquet is there, especially when we have a high volume of injuries. If these patients get stacked up in the ER, that tourniquet could be forgotten about and can result in the patient possibly losing their limb. Don't loosen the tourniquet until after you've don't loosen the tourniquet after you've applied it. Once it's applied, it stays applied. Document the time that you put the tourniquet on. Splints can help us in controlling bleeding. Air splints can control internal and external bleeding associated with severe injuries. We don't use a whole lot of air splints in this area, but they act as kind of a pressure dressing when applied to an extremity. Rigid splints basically immobilize fracture and prevent further uh, soft tissue damage. So once you get the splint on, the bone ends aren't moving independently and causing tissue damage. Now when we talk about bleeding from the nose, ears, and mouth, these can be caused by several conditions. A skull fracture, serious facial injuries, a sinusitis, you know, the infections or cried, dried cracked nasal mucosa. We do see uh, bloody noses during the, the winter months. High blood pressure, which can result in nose bleeding. It's normally a sign of severe hypertension. Coagulation disorders can cause bleeding from the nose, ears, and mouth. Or digital trauma, meaning that they pick their nose way too much. Nosebleed, technically called epistaxis, is a common emergency. We see them throughout the winter. Occasionally it can cause enough blood loss to send a patient to shock, especially those patients who are on blood thinners. Now, if it's in the forward part, the, the part of the nose that shows, it can usually be controlled by pinching the nostrils together and applying cold application. Now, with a lot of these, especially the, the, the bleeding towards the back of the nose um, into the sinuses, people tend to swallow that blood. And blood, when it's swallowed, can cause a lot of irritation to the stomach. And when the blood gets into the stomach, it forms clots. And people can start vomiting up these clots. Well, these clots tend to be long and stringy and can actually affect the airway. So keep in mind, you may have to actually take a piece of gauze and pull these clots out of a person's mouth. But a good way to do them is a, to control them is First off, having them not swallow the blood, but spit it out. And if they're bleeding towards the back of their mouth, give them a suction catheter, the, the tonsil suction catheter, the Yonkar suction catheter. Show them how to operate it. And a lot of people will actually suction the back of their mouth on their own. So that's a good way to do that. We want to avoid them swallowing blood and having that vomit that could cause a, uh, a difficult airway. Now bleeding from the nose or, or ears following a head injury, this is a serious sign. It may indicate a skull fracture. It may be difficult to control, but we don't want to stop the blood flow. I'll tell you why. When we dam the blood flow, it's going to back up into the cranium, the cranial vault, and cause an increase in intracranial pressure. Instead, what we want to do is loosely cover the bleeding site with a sterile gauze pad and light compression with a dressing. Again, we don't want to stop it to where it's damming up, causing the increase of Internal bleeding normally requires surgery or other hospital interventions. We're going to be seeing some changes in the field. We're going to be using transexemic acid. So
this is a uh, compound that's used to help control bleeding internally. It's given IV by the paramedics. So it's really important to get paramedics rolling on these internal bleeding cases. But it's important to keep the patient calm, reassured, and as still and quiet as possible. We also want to maintain uh, them in a supine position to treat for shock, along with providing high flow oxygen. And above all, please keep these patients warm. Trauma patients have to be kept warm. Again, it truly affects morbidity and mortality. Even just a couple degrees of uh, heat loss can negatively affect a uh, trauma or internal bleeding patient. That's all for this presentation. Thank you for hanging in there with me. I look forward to uh, discussing this further with you in class and along with our lab sessions. Let's keep uh, going in this class, and you guys are all doing a great job. Please try to keep up, and I look forward to seeing you soon.